Thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, before starting, I want to congratulate uh, the University of Manchester I think, for uh, organizing this kind of event and of, for putting uh, our data and other organizations' data available to each of you. And very pleased this time to be here because I see at least two of the projects are using our data. So uh, it's pretty uh, <laughs> very nice for us, I mean, to see that. Um, I will not talk as the same as the other uh, speakers, but uh, I think I will use the title of the session, which is Understanding the World, Evidence and Impact, to lead my presentations. Uh, I think it's Gareth who says that uh, we don't need yesterday data, we need today's data, but at the same time he says that, well, for organizations it's very difficult to give you today's data because there is uh, a chain of information before getting uh, the organization itself. It's exactly what happened to us. If you look at uh, the IEA statistics, and I will talk about 2009, and you say, why 2009? Okay, we are almost in 2012. It's two years uh, late. I mean, we are not interested. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, that's more or less the most recent years that we have available for you, uh, at least in terms of detailed uh, information regarding consumption and transformation. But now if you want to have information on what we call supply, which is production, import, export, stock changes, that we have information for 2010. But why I will say I will make focus my presentation on 2009, because as you will see, it's a very interesting year, and there was at least three major events in terms of energy happened in 2009. Uh, why such a long uh, delay in getting proper data? Well, first, I mean, you have to know that statisticians in energy ministries in uh, countries face a hard time. Uh, poor people in charge of energy statistics uh, they have to face the liberalization of the market. And I take the example of my own country, France. Uh, in France, you used to have one electricity company, EDF, Electricité de France. Uh, and there was in the ministry one person in charge of collecting the information from the, on electricity from Electricité de France. But now you have tens, hundreds of companies because market has been deregulated and you still have one person in charge in the ministry in charge of collecting the information. So this guy now has to face hundred uh, companies. On top of that, well, before EDF was very pleased to give the information, but now since there is competition, it's not so pleased. So when the guy calls, say, oh, could you give me your data? I say, ha ha, come and find them. So uh, not only, I mean, you have more work, but at the same time, it's okay, it's more difficult to get the information. Guy in charge of energy statistics, guy or ladies, I'm sorry, uh, also now have been asked to do more and more work. In the past, it was just basic energy statistics. But now you have more companies to survey, we just mentioned it. Renewables, I see uh, the uh, poster on renewables, okay? You don't get information on renewables the same way you get information on nuclear power plants, okay? Nuclear power plant, we are talking about 1,000 megawatts. Uh, a windmill, you are talking about tens, hundred kilowatts. So there is a big difference between how you collect the information on renewable as compared to traditional in source of information. Often people are asked to collect information to build energy efficiency indicators. Well, it's clear, energy efficiency is the way to go. But now when you talk about energy efficiency indicators, you take the residential sector, for instance. In the past, you used to have the consumption of the household, the residential sector, point. But now, if you want to be very precise, not only you have to have the total household consumption, but you have how much goes to eating, to cooling, to cooking, to lighting, to TV, to fridge, and so on and so forth. So it's another set of information that you have to collect. And it's not enough, because if you have the consumption, you want to pick your indicators, you have also to collect information on activity data. So what the total square meter of houses which is heated, how many fridges you have in your countries, uh, and so on and so forth. So the people, not only they have to face liberalizations, confidentiality, more work, uh, and also much more detailed information. Often they are asked also to work on CO2 emissions, and I understand that later there will be a presentation on CO2 emissions, and it's often the same person who has to do the same thing. And do you think that they will have more resources? No, well, all countries face budget cuts. So uh, when they are lucky, they have the same number of people, but when they are not lucky, sometimes they have cuts and they have the reduction in the number of people. So more work, less people, then you can explain why you have delays in the information. 
But it's not all. You have also very fast turnover in uh, staff working on statistics. And just want to show you two slides about that. In the past, I would not say the good old time, but in the past, a statistician started, start, start, uh, started to work on statistics just after university, he was 20, 21, 22. He had his diploma in hand, said, okay, well, I love statistics, I will work on statistics. And he continued his career, 30s, 40s, 50s, until retirement age. There, was, there were two periods. The first period was where he was gaining, or she was gaining, uh, experience, and then passing his her experience to the newcomers. And it was fine, it was a good rollover. But now, look at what happened. People still start 20, well, instead of 21, 22, 23, 24, they got PhD, they got more diploma, and they say, oh yeah, I love statistics. Start, and then suddenly you have all these little devils coming, say, people in charge of modeling say, hey, you work on statistics? No, please come and join us in the modeling, or work in environment, that's the future is environment, or private sector, how much you receive in your country, oh, I can double or triple your salary, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, that's an evidence uh, there is less and less people who have uh, an expertise on energy statistics. What I say, I'm sure, on energy statistics can be true also on other fields. Okay, uh, that's it. But now I will go to uh, a few words on the impact on the economic crisis. In 2009, well, starting in 2008, well, as you know, uh, the world uh, faced an economic crisis. When I say the world, it's more the developed world, okay, the OECD countries. When you look at the impact of the crisis, uh, you see that for OECD countries, I think the GDP growth was not a growth, it was a decrease of more than two, uh, almost three percent. While in some countries, if you take People's Republic of China, it was an increase of nine percent, and uh, India it was seven percent. As a whole, for the world, uh, the world suffers a minus two percent decrease in the GDP from 2008 to 2009. How does that translate in terms uh, of, uh, of, of the evolution of GDP between OECD countries and non-OECD countries? Well, uh, that's in uh, PPP's terms. In PPP's term, okay, uh, the OECD was always uh, above uh, non-OECD. But because of the crisis, uh, this is the evolution. You see there was a decrease in the uh, GDP of OECD countries. So for the first time in 2009, non-OECD countries overtook OECD countries in terms of GDP PPP. When you look at GDP by uh, market exchange rate, there is still a wide gap between OECD countries and non-OECD countries. But that's the first ma major lesson from uh, 2009. Now, how does that translate in terms of energy consumption? Well, if you look at the energy consumptions of OECD countries in blue, in yellow of non-OECD countries, and if you had what we call bunkers, international maritime bunkers or aviation bunkers, well, the OECD used in the past to be much more energy consuming than non-OECD countries. It's in 2005, for the first time, that non-OECD countries' was, consumption was bigger than the OECD consumption. But now look at 2009, Since the first oil crisis in 1974, and in fact much before that, 2009 is the first year where the global energy consumption went down. Is it a good news? Is it a bad news? That's, you, everybody can, uh, the reasons, okay, well, it depends on the reasons. If the, if the countries are more energy efficient, that's good news. If it was the effect of the crisis, it might be not such a good, good news. Uh, and last major event which happened in 2009 was the who became the largest energy consumer in the world. It's not a competition. I mean, you don't want to have a prize because you are the largest energy consumer. <laughs> don't, don't think about it. Uh, but if you look in the past, in 1971, for instance, if you had U.S., U.S. was three or four times higher in terms of energy consumption than People's Republic of China. Uh, the forecast that analysts made in the past shows that by 2012, if you look at the trends of both US or China, China should have 
over to taken uh, U.S. But in fact, because of the crisis of 2009, uh, look at the consumption of uh, U.S. and consumption of China. China, in 2009, became the largest energy consumer. Nothing wrong, as I said. I mean, in China, there are 1.3 billion people, while in the U.S., there are around 300 million people. So if you look at per, per capita, U.S. is still five or six times more than uh, the Chinese. But in terms of energy player in the world, in terms of energy consumption, well, there is now China is the largest player in terms of energy consumption. Now you will ask me, okay, what about uh, the trends? Well, that's come from the recently published World Energy Outlook publications. If you look at the forecast from 2010 to 2035, you will see that OECD increase in terms of energy consumption is very, very small. It's the bottom line. But look at the joint surplus of energy consumption from India and China. Uh, it was, uh, okay, uh, just a, a one last slide. Ask me, if you ask me, okay, has the decrease in energy consumption continued in 2010? I will tell you no. The preliminary data that uh, we have shows that uh, the, there was a rebound by 4.5% in terms of energy consumption worldwide even 7% due to the big increase in the coal consumptions uh, in China uh, on coal and 2% uh, on, on oil. So what is the, ever, the consequence of the ever-growing demand for energy? Well, I think I will scare you. Uh, we have a scenario which is called the 450 ppm scenario, uh, which is Scenarios that all experts in the world would like to see, because if we have that, there will be an increase at the end of the century of the average global temperature by 2 degrees Celsius. But if you look at the trends as they are now, we are not going to a 450 ppm scenario. We are going to a 650 ppm scenario. That means that it's not 2 degrees at the end of the century that we will have. I will not be there anymore. Uh, but it's six degrees that we will face. And no, nobody knows what could be the consequences on the climate and on the, on the life on, on Earth. Uh, can we do something about it? I don't want to leave you with a very pessimistic view. So I don't want everybody to go and uh, kill themselves tonight. Uh, yes, we can do something, but we can all do something, okay? Well, you have so many countries around uh, the room, so. Uh, the first thing, well, we should increase uh, energy efficiency. If you look at this forecast, energy efficiency can contribute to reduce by 53% this growth. So be more efficient. Maybe we could switch off a few lines here. Uh, uh, change our energy mix. Instead of using coal, instead of using oil, instead of going gas, well, let's be more uh, renewables oriented. Well, there is a presentation, the poster on the renewables. There is a cost. It's not uh, free. Uh, but I think that's the price that we have to pay. I mean, if we want uh, to have a, a safe world in uh, eight, 90 years time. Now the question is, should we use more or less nuclear? Well, nuclear is good for CO2, uh, for greenhouse gas. Nuclear has other projects. So I don't have problems. I don't want to do that. We should be cleaner. Uh, we should develop CCS, which is uh, carbon capture and storage. It, it's a very important. Uh, there is a few projects going on, but it's not enough. I will say that, to, to conclude, that the world is not lacking of energy, but the world is lacking of time. If we are not implementing measures right now to develop uh, renewables, to develop energy efficiency policy, Nobody knows what could happen, not for your children, but for our grandchildren or our grand-grandchildren. Thank you very much. Don't go and kill yourself, please. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
But it's not the same in UK, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kwame Kai Bunyasena from the University of Leicester and I'm doing a research in energy economics. From I would like to ask IEA that from your opinion, do you think renewable energy and nuclear power can decrease CO2 in the future? Is this true? Thank you. Well, just to, to take the, the title of the sessions. Uh, it's uh, an evidence uh, because of the impact. It's clear. Uh, China, for instance, uh, has, a, has an enormous program of development of electricity production. So, but a lot of people still in China does not have access to electricity, so they will have access to electricity because GDP per capita is increasing. Now they have the choice. Either they do through more coal, and by the way, China used to be self-sufficient in terms of coal, consumption, but now they are importing, which will have an impact on the coal price in the world, but that's, that's a parenthesis. So they have the choice between more coal with more CO2 or by doing something different. And something different is renewables. And as you know, China now is becoming the largest producer of PV and windmills and nuclear. So now will the impact of Fukushima be a major one and countries will back up like Germany for instance but you have other countries like UK who have decided to continue and to go on on nuclear so for the time being what we know from China they have decided to go on on nuclear so yes certainly that will displace a lot of the production which was supposed to be done through coal by either nuclear or renewable so yes there will be an impact Just out of interest, um, in the 2004 um, energy outlook, I found a slide that says uh, that the non-renewables are 96% and the renewables are roughly 4% of all the energy um, we use. Um, I didn't find that slide. I went through the, the 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9 recently. I didn't find that slide anymore. Is there something in the, in the latest one, in the 2011, that shows us an increase in total? Renewables versus non renewables. Yeah, uh, I, I think this slide is wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Well, no, but uh, I discussed with a person in charge of the World Energy Outlook, and uh, before 2005 and 2006, the World Energy Outlook, which is a publication of the IA, was considering only commercial, commercial energy. And if you take in terms of renewables, you have to know that biomass not biofuels, okay, not the new advanced biofuels, biomass, fuel wood and others represents around 10 to 11 percent of the global energy consumption. So when you are talking about the 4 percent is uh, hydro and uh, the few uh, biofuels. Biomass is in here 2.8. Uh, right. Okay. So, so. so it's 11 percent. Okay, thanks. And I would say that uh, in Africa for the whole continent, it's 50%. Uh, for countries like Ethiopia, it's 90%. And, and these numbers are available yes. to the right? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen your uh, suggestion there. Uh, what we need to do to actually make sure that we have sustainable, continue to have energy. And you like to have nuclear, but you can give it a question mark. And also looking at what happened in the Fukushima plant with nuclear, is, is it also becoming a threat? Uh, uh, and then also, um, is that also compatible to the climate change uh, agenda as well? Well, uh, uh, as I said, I mean, if you look at uh, the Fukushima impact, I mean, first of all, I mean, you should go back up and look at the Three Mile Islands impact and the Chernobyl impact. After Chernobyl, nobody wanted any more of nuclear, but after a few years, people were back into nuclear. So there is a psychological impact, and we should not minimize it, okay? It's there, and we should, whatever, if we decide to go on with nuclear, we should have safer uh, nuclear power plants, okay? It's clear. Uh, so it's too early to say if the impact will be a big impact or not a big impact. From what we know, it seems that 
except a few countries which have decided to turn the page of uh, nuclear, uh, many countries will continue uh, on, on nuclear. Uh, as you know, uh, in France there will be elections next year and nuclear is a big topic uh, between uh, the different parties. Uh, so if we say that, yes, there will be an impact, but the minimum impact, so this scenario seems to be quite uh, reasonable. Now, if the impact of uh, Fukushima is big, then you will have to compensate and to make uh, electricity by something else. Could be coal, and with coal, yes, there will be impact on CO2, and we are closer to the 650 ppm scenarios and the 400, five, uh, 450 ppm scenario. 